our chat history with the you're frozen i can't hear you so i have a uh, i have stacy with me a uh, longtime friend uh, co-author we did a book together fellow rabble rouser um you're tuning in from a virtual background representing florida or bermuda or somewhere warm and awesome uh definitely yeah. <laughs> but you you live in los angeles now and how has the move from san francisco to la been for you so far yeah it's been it's been great so i moved down to los angeles it's crazy to say it's been about two years now um, and moved down here because of work. The previous company that uh, I had founded acquired a company that was based in, in LA. So um, when we acquired that company, I decided to make the move down here and have loved it ever since. I mean, it's sunny. There's, I live like 10 minutes away from a beach, so I love that. Um, very different kind of mentality. It's a little bit slower pace of life than San Francisco, which I was really nervous about for my personal my personality. Um, but I've been really enjoying it and trying to trying to get a little bit more work life balance. I was gonna say, I mean, you, you're ahead of the curve a little bit in terms of a lot of people relocating from San Francisco or New York to other places. Uh, I know that you know, like Austin is in the conversation. Uh, like my executive coach has just sold his place outside of New York and is moving to Boulder, Colorado with his family. Uh, and so I think it's interesting that you stayed in LA and, and stayed in California. Um, what would you say are the pros of moving and maybe, you know, work-life balance seems to be one of them, but what, what are the pros of moving away from Silicon Valley? And, uh, are there any cons or sort of things you've given up in the move that you are really, uh, yearning for, or that you would have, uh, warned yourself about before making the switch? Yeah. I mean, I think a pro, like you said, is, is to some extent work-life balance. It's um, a little bit of a slower pace of life in Los Angeles than San Francisco. Uh, so I like that aspect. It's not as easy to get wrapped up in the hype. I feel like when I was living in um, San Francisco, there was a lot of hype around um, just all the startups that were being started, everything going on. Um, sorry, I have a dog in the background. In this new COVID life, work from home. Now you can bring your dog to the dog park every day. I know, like you're really, you're like you're really big into that and like having that routine. Exactly. Uh, you go on super long walks in the morning with the dog. Yeah, that's a pro of LA too. I there's like a, a hike that's like five minutes away from me that I just walk to every morning, and I do that and take my dog to the dog park. Um, so I love all of that. I would say one of the maybe you know one of the cons is yeah, the pro is you're not all caught up in the hype. One of the cons is maybe you don't hear things as quickly as I did in San Francisco. New things that were happening, new technologies that were being built, companies that were on the, the up and coming um, kind of scene, all that sort of stuff. You know, you're a little bit more removed from it in LA. You hear about that stuff in LA too, um, but it's different. I, and I feel like the types of businesses being built in San Francisco versus LA are also very different. LA is very consumer focused. San Francisco, consumer like physical product focused. And San Francisco is more technology focused. So there's kind of interesting, interesting juxtapositions there as well. Are you okay with that though, in, in some extent? Because you, know, you, you sold your, your previous company to your current employer, you know, WorkJam, and you, know, you have a a, a lock-in period and, and you know you're I know you're not just working there because they bought your company but you actually uh, appreciate the work jam vision and like enjoy your job but I also know that you're a serial entrepreneur and at some point you're going to want to do your own thing and so uh, do you feel okay with like being a half step slower than some other people at least in your own perception by being in LA versus uh, Silicon Valley or do you think like you're missing out on possibly what your next opportunity might be beyond, you know, work jam. Like yeah. what, what goes through your head as someone who, you know, is, I would bet a lot of money is going to start another company at some point in the future, maybe multiple companies. And yet that's not your current life stage. Maybe. Yeah. It's a great question. And it is something that I've wrestled with a lot. There have been times where I've been like, Oh, maybe I should move back to San Francisco. I would say that because the pace of life from a work standpoint here is slower doesn't mean that my pace of life has gotten slower. I think 
most entrepreneurs and you yourself know, like, that's just kind of how you're hardwired. You're always going to be going at 150%. That's just who we are. Um, and so for me, it's, it's kind of about going 150% in a different way. Like in San Francisco, I was 150% about my businesses. And now I'm like 100% work, but I'm like, oh, the, the extra 50% that I might've given to my business, now I'm giving to like, working on myself and trying to understand what are my values? Where do I, where do I see my life going? Who do I want, who do I want to be a part of my life going in that direction? How can I spend time with my dog? Like it's different types of personal introspection that I'm doing and giving, giving a lot to that. Whereas before it was all work. And I think when you're an entrepreneur, you have to give that 150% to your work. Uh, when you're starting the company, you're leading the company. And then there's kind of a shift that happens, which is when you're working somewhere else, you're still, I'm still giving a hundred percent to that, but I'm starting to look a little bit more at who am I, what are the things that I want to learn to level up at each stage of my life? Um, and to your point, like I love my job right now, but I also see LA as this great opportunity to learn about other types of businesses and other things that people are doing while also working on my personal development. Yeah. And yeah, as I was thinking about what I wanted to ask you today, um, because this, yeah, this originally was like, a, we were thinking of an AMA and like opening up and then I was like, I'm just going to ask you questions myself. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, we had some conversations when we were like literally kids, you know, you were 19, 20, I was, uh, 16, 17, 18 around the emotions of selling your first company to reputation.com and, and sort of transitioning into that, uh, next period of time where you know, we were working on um, 2 billion under 20, you were thinking about what the next uh, company would be, who you wanted to work with, things like that. Um, what was it like for you selling Forge? And you know, can you take us into that like experience of you know, going through the process of selling it, like having the papers in front of you, signing on the dotted line, like what happens next? You know, what, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, very different experiences. So as you mentioned, I sold my first company back when I was 20 years old. And it was the first time that I had ever, um, that I had ever sold something. And so that was really exciting, but there were a lot of mo emotions that were wrapped up in that. And at 20 years old, I feel like I didn't really know how to process that so much. It was more of like, this is, it was a really high high where it was like, this is so cool. Like we're selling the, the company and this is awesome. I'm only 20 years old and there's money and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so it's a really, really high, high. And then that was kind of hard because I had worked on that business for a few years at that point. And again, was going full steam ahead. It was like 150% in, in that business. Nothing else mattered. That was, that was my thing through and through. Yeah. And, and a few years when you're 20 is like, well, you know, a quarter of your life. <laughs> Literally. And so then when we sold the company, it was like kind of this identity crisis a little bit because I was really excited. So you had that emotion paired with a 20 year old now wondering like, who am I? And like, I sold this company. I had made a lot of sacrifices, like dropping out of college, a bunch of stuff for this business. And then all of a sudden I didn't have the business anymore. Like I sold it and I went to work for reputation.com. Uh, and I kind of went through this identity crisis of who am I? What am I doing? Who do I want to be? Should I get a college degree? Like all those sorts of things that when you're 20 years old, you're trying to figure out how do I even process all this stuff while also trying to transition your team and your technology and then you working a job for someone else where you don't have the decision-making authority. Like there's just a lot of stuff going on. So I felt like during that process, I had really high highs and really low lows moments of time where I was like, this is fantastic. This is great. And other times where I was like, what am I doing with my life? Who am I? Um, fast forward. So I sold that company when I was 20 years old, fast forward seven years. I'm, I'm 27 now. And I sold forge to, to work jam. Um, and I just feel like I have seven more years of life experience being able to manage my own emotions with those highs and lows. And so, you know, selling Forge, I love, I absolutely love Work Jam. And so the decision to sell the company to Work Jam was an easy one. The missions completely aligned. I felt like we could add a lot of value. I love what they're doing. 
Um, so I was like, this is, there's a lot of things that's probably a whole nother topic, but uh, it was kind of a, a match made in heaven from that standpoint. And I love working at work jam now. So the highs and lows weren't, weren't as much as the first time. And I'm really appreciative for that because I think it's that first time gave me a lot of perspective for this time and hopefully for time three, four, five, six, you know, however many of these I do. Yeah. And, and not that you were like immature before, but like over time, you've definitely matured, mellowed out, like added complexity to your life and uh, figured out, you're still figuring out as we all are, like what your priority stack looks like in terms of work and life and balancing that and the dog. And like, you know, I want to add a dog to our life, but Tara would kill me if I got a puppy right now. Ooh, or at least she would for like the first week or two. And then I think she would love the dog. Um, <laughs> but, you know, given your personality, like, uh, and, and just how ambitious you are, um, are, are you the type of person that like promised yourself, you know, years ago that you would like accomplish certain things by the time you were 30? Uh, and if so, are there any things on the list that you haven't done yet? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, like, I think back, there were definitely things that I wanted when I was a little girl that I was like, oh, I'm going to work for these things. And I think when you're young, a lot of those things tend to be more material things. So I think when I was like a teenager, right, I was like, oh, it'd be so cool to have a Ferrari. Um, I think there were things like that. I didn't really have concrete goals of like, I want to start a business and sell a business by this age. I want to publish a book by this age. I want to, like, I didn't really have that outline, I think there were things that I materially wanted that I was like, to get those, you have to work hard. My viewpoints on that have now changed, but that was probably like 13 year old Stacy being like, it'd be cool to have a fast car that's convertible. Um, and so I think I kind of knew that I was going to have to work hard. And I think that was kind of a driving factor for me of, hey, whatever it is that you choose to do, you got to be 150% in. You can't have one foot in, one foot out. This is an all or nothing thing. And that's kind of the way that throughout my, the course of my career so far, I've, I've chosen to operate, which I think has helped make me successful. Um, now that I'm a little bit older, I do start to set more goals for myself of things. Um, but I also try not to be too hard on myself. Like one of the things that I always remind people of, because a lot of times I'll do public speaking and people are like, oh, you must be like a super smart whiz kid, all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, I didn't even graduate in the top 25% of my high school class from like a grades perspective. Like I'm not, I'm not any smarter than anyone else. I'm just very curious and I'm not afraid to take a risk to go try something. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, when it comes to, when it comes to goals for me, the older I've gotten, it's always been the goal is to learn so that I can build a, a toolbox uh, so that any time that I have a new project in front of me, I know which tools to use. So do you, uh, so maybe there's nothing on like the bucket list or like the to-do list that you have to do by 30, um, but have what, uh, what goals have come to mind then uh, or, or things you want to learn in the next three years, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think for, for right now, I'm in a complete, complete learning phase. And so one of the things that I love about LA, as an example, is talking to other entrepreneurs here about their types of businesses. Like, I don't know that I would ever start a consumer products business, but I love learning about it. And so like, never say never, maybe someday I will. Um, but, but I like learning about that for now. Uh, in terms of other goals, I think I... Like I truly 150% believe in the work jam mission. So I have goals for the job that I have now to try and push that mission forward um, while I'm personally learning about a lot of other stuff on the side. Um, and then I just have like very, like, again, trying to get more work-life balance in my life. I have goals around work-life balance. Like I wanna hike Kilimanjaro by the time I'm 30. I wanna do certain things like that that are, not necessarily work related, but things that invite I me on that trip. Whenever, yeah, uh, whenever we're allowed to travel again, I'd, I'd be down. I, yeah. I have quite a few acquaintances in my network who have done that, and they all point to that as a pretty epic experience. It's also like much more palatable than Everest. <laughs> yes, 
completely. I've like watched a million videos on it and I'm like, this is gonna happen. And it's not- Kilimanjaro is like, you will have an awful day or two, but it'll be worth it. Everest is like, you might die. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I was looking up the um, stats, it's like Kilimanjaro, like not a lot of people die doing it. It's pretty safe to do. And it is one of those life moments of like, like I did it, so. What, what's the high level overview on WorkCham? Because I've, I've like read about it a little bit as I've you know referenced your like LinkedIn profile to like have you out in Bermuda or um, set this up or just as we've conversed and I've tracked your, your, your life because we're good friends. <laughs> like, but yeah. how would you describe WorkCham and, and what do you think their future looks like uh, in terms of you know, growing that business? Yeah, definitely. So WorkJam, really what it is, is we call it a, a, a digital workplace. And so what that really means is it's a software that enables primarily hourly employees to be able to do everything that they need for their, their work life through one application. So we have an app on mobile phones um, or on the web where people can do everything from now when they get on site for a shift, they can take a health check to make sure that they're healthy and keeping others around them safe. They can clock in for their shift. They can see their schedule. They can swap shifts with other people. They can watch training videos to, to unlock new shifts that they can pick up. So if I'm, you know, uh, uh, let's say that I work at a grocery store, I can go watch all the training videos and then work in the deli. So like unlock new skills. Um, it's got things like express pay in it, but if I'm an hourly employee, it allows me to get paid immediately after I work my shift. And one of the things for me when I was starting Forge that was really big for me personally, my best friend works an hourly job in retail. And I always wanted a way for her to, um, to really be able to have more flexibility and control over her life. Um, and so that's kind of why I started Forge. And now with WorkJam, Forge really focused on the flexible scheduling aspect and unlocking new job careers by helping uh, people, companies share talent. And WorkJam is basically that on steroids. So all of that stuff around flexible scheduling and talent sharing has been incorporated into the product. Um, but it's, it's the whole suite of things, which is why I'm excited about it, because it's extremely powerful for someone who's working one of these jobs to have that level of transparency and insight into their work and have control over the hours that they're working which I personally think is awesome. I mean, 58% of the American population works an hourly job. And so why do these people not have that level of control and transparency just blows my mind. We're in 2020. So I'm like, so happy to, to be at a company that's trying to be part of that solution. Yeah. And as you're talking, I mean, it, it seems like there's a similarity between the sort of acquisition of my social cloud to reputation.com and you know, what you've done with Forge and WorkJam in that uh, the company you started ended up being a feature or part of the overall like tech stack experience of the acquiring company. Um, and I know I've talked to your brother about this actually, but you know, he said that one of his strategies or thought patterns was to actually to do that, like build a business specifically with a few potential acquirers in mind, especially in like, the enterprise world where you know, you know, you're building this company to potentially get acquired by one of these four or five major players uh, and to solve one of their challenges because you can move quicker, you can, um, you know, be more flexible, you could take a, uh, you know, a full 100% committed approach versus the large company, which has to do a lot of things for a lot of people because they're bigger. Uh, was that something that was in mind for you with either of the companies that you've started? Uh, and you know, if, if not, how does something like an, a work jam acquisition come to fruition? Cause I've, you know, I've never, I've, I've raised money, but I've never raised money where I'm giving up equity. It's always been just, you know, a permissory note. I've paid back uh, a friend or whatever that have given me money and I've purposely built my companies to be bootstrapped and, you know, sort of more lifestyle businesses, but that doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. It means like profitable and revenue generating for perpetuity, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but I do have ambitions to one day start a tech startup and, you know, take the more of the route that you've taken. So was that 
was that a strategy you had from the onset with either business or with Forge? If so, I would love to hear your elaboration. If not, then I would love to know how uh, acquisitions even start bubbling up. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, like when I, when starting the businesses, it wasn't necessarily the strategy to say, Hey, let's start with a small feature of something and then get acquired. I think in both cases, and I'd be curious what my brother's thought is on this, but I think in both cases, we were early movers in the market, certainly in, in Forge as an example, like when, when I started Forge back in 2016, this concept of talent sharing of two, two businesses partnering together to share their employees was like completely unheard of. No one even knew, I would say talent sharing and people would be like, what, what does that even mean? Like, what is that? Um, fast forward to 2020, uh, now it seems like the, the whole industry knows about that because we've worked for four years to try and build the mindset and the mind shift in the industry that like, hey, this is not only something that is a, a fringe idea, this is something that works. And by the way, this is something that's needed. And I think, you know, in the height of COVID, we saw this to an extreme, right? Where it was, you had all these businesses that were deemed non-essential shutting down, all these businesses that were deemed essential that needed a lot more labor. And all of a sudden people were like, oh, like, this is why we really need talent sharing. It's because there are flexes. As you're, as you're saying this, I remember hearing on the Masters of Scale podcast with Reed Hoffman, how the... Uh, I believe it was the Panera CEO had worked with the CBS CEO to have a um, talent sharing program yeah. where uh, extra Panera you know, staff you know, could go from being furloughed to going to work for CBS who needed more people mm -hmm. and then would have a job you know, whenever Panera was ready to uh, hire more people again. Yep. That's four years. That's four years of hard yeah. work that got us to a point where that was something that people were like, oh, this, this might actually make sense. And there are some and two different, changes. two different economies where you've now proven that, you know, one where uh, unemployment was at a record low, you know, quote unquote, or at least, yeah. you know, there, there's like the stock market and then there's the real economy. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, there was um, in theory record, like low unemployment. And then, you know, you were proving it out from the talent side needing unfortunately maybe two jobs to right. pay their bills um, and then you showed it from the employer side uh, during a pandemic yeah yeah completely and i think now people have come around to this idea that like to your point this works in almost any market it works in low unemployment it works if there's a pandemic certainly and it also works during different seasons like uh, an hvac company might need a lot of people to work in the summer and then no one to work in the winter because you know, who's turning on their, their cooling during the winter, right? But that might be complete opposite where a retailer might not need many people in the summer, but they need a ton of people during the winter because people are shopping for the holidays. Um, and so that's something like my mindset to business has always been, um, you know, find something, find something that the world really needs and then go out and like spearhead it from the beginning. So talent sharing was a prime example of that where it was like, I was the only one talking about it for a long time. <laughs> and then finally, um, you know, after tooting that horn for four years, it became something that was big. And to your point, there's a point where it's beneficial to go out on your own and, and spearhead that and get the early adopters and start the growth trajectory of that thing. And then there's a point with a lot of businesses where you look at the overall market and you say, okay, now the thing that used to be fringe that I was saying this needs to happen, now that that's a little bit more mainstream, it might make sense for us to partner up with a more mainstream platform to be able to spread these two missions together to get scale faster and grow this quicker. Um, and that's just kind of how it played out. I didn't, didn't necessarily plan it that way. Um, but that's kind of how it played out and I wouldn't change it for the world. <laughs> so what, uh, what industries, what problems are most interesting to you as you look out maybe f five to 10 years from now where you, know, you might be a, an early mover now or you know, in two or three years, it might be ripe to, to jump in and try and start solving those problems. You know, what, what trends come to mind for you or things are you, are you learning about so that you might be in a position to act on it uh, if you see a real opportunity? 
Yeah. It's a really great question. And to be honest, I'm still trying to, I'm still trying to learn. I feel like I've been so heads down on this one problem and to some extent still am because of my job today. Um, but things that do ex Maybe we can be even meta about it. I mean, what's, so what, what would, what is your process of starting to learn about the trends and opportunities for the next decade? So as you're like going from heads down to heads up, you're starting this learning mode. Um, I think that might actually be more interesting rather than just getting like random spaghetti on the wall of what you think is interesting. Like how, what's your process like to learn about potential opportunities in the next decade? Yeah. Um, for me, it's all about consuming different types of content. So I had a mentor once who told me, um, kind of when I first started my career, he was like, Stacy, if you put the same content into yourself as everyone else is putting into them, you're never going to have any truly original thoughts. It's only going to be, you know, the things that everyone else is thinking if you're listening to the same stuff that everyone else is listening to or watching the same stuff everyone else is watching. And so that kind of always hit me where I was like, interesting. I want to really diversify the type of content that I'm putting in front of myself so that I can get a lot of different viewpoints, get exposed to a lot of different things, um, to be able to pull on a lot of different areas for what I want to do next. And so for me, it's, it's honestly about like randomness of content. Like I read a ton of different blogs. I'll watch a ton of different videos to things like completely, completely seemingly random and people are like, why are you interested in that? Like for a long time, not a long time, for probably six months, a few years ago, I went really deep into sports management and like, how do you manage a sports team? What are the economics of like a stadium? I remember us putting together a little pitch for like a European soccer club <laughs> together yeah, <laughs> to possibly like do some consulting there. Um, and I, I'm just passionate about sports as a fan, but then you were like, oh, sports management. And I have this like cool connection. I was like, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah we've, we've definitely like had two or three like ideas of businesses beyond a book that we just never ended up executing on properly. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah so you yeah. had sports management. I know you're big on, on music and, and that's been like a lifelong passion of yours. Yeah. And for me, it's just about like exploring, exploring ideas um, and exploring different industries. Not that I have any intention to, to do anything with it, but, but just because, you know, if I learn something now, maybe three years from now it comes back. Or maybe if I have a friend that works in sports management who wants some ideas on it, I at least have exposure into that industry and can pull on other things that I know from other places to hopefully have an insightful conversation. So what, what are you reading currently? Because I, I know that's part of your morning routine is, you know, taking in a lot of uh, content and, and reading. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm reading a few things right now. Um, obviously, I'm reading a lot of, a lot of blogs. Um, I, can, I can send some afterwards if other people are interested, but I'm reading a ton of blogs. I'm reading a lot of books. Um, I'm rereading a book right now called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's all about leadership and team development. Um, I'm reading books about, about retail, uh, not retail, about real estate and like uh, buying and flipping houses. I think that'd be like a super fun project to do uh, just to like buy a house and flip a house. I don't know, just like working with my hands seems super cool rather than like always. Let's talk about offline that. about that. I know, if, I know I teased yeah. that in email, but I'm not, not ready to talk publicly about an idea that I'm working on, but we could talk privately. Yeah, um, let's do so it. So real estate, you're looking at, um, I guess, HR books and, you know, executive function uh, and being a better you know, leader, you know, now that you have a bigger team. Um, I'm doing other what, random things. Like I'm this, this week I've been on a kick of like looking at friends, personality tests, like asking them to take personality tests and me just like, kind of analyzing them to try and get a better understanding of how people operate and how they think and, and what the differences and similarities are between me and other people to be more maybe self-aware when I'm interacting with folks. Um, so it's kind of like a bunch of random stuff, but it's all stuff that someday might be useful and might help me come up with the next thing that I'm interested in. Uh, and yeah, I, I think that's super important. It, it's part of the values I talked about with meeting of the minds and, you know, the 
importance of your network because we always think about the you know the opportunity to get referrals from your network or to get a better job opportunity or if you're hiring you know you go through your network um, but we don't always think about the quality of information that we're getting um, through our news feed because of our friends or um, if you need to learn something uh, like for this real estate project I'm working on, there was someone in our Meeting in the Minds Network who is a serial entrepreneur in that space. And so you know, he had information on two or three ways to potentially capitalize a project that I had no idea about. And it was just a 30 minute call, but it saved me hours and hours of research. You know, if I were to execute on it, it'd be tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of savings. Uh, and who knows how much time I would save uh, or, or hardship or pain. Um, and that was just from one conversation. So I, I, I definitely look at my network as the biggest source of information. Um, I need to read more books. That's something I've been uh, trying to do more of. Um, I've been getting into audio lately to like listen to books while I run. Um, and then, you know, podcasts, of course, uh, email newsletters, as, as I've been trying to grow the, the new Substack newsletter, I have a couple of them that I'm following. Um, so I, yeah, I, I read the New York Times, although I, I do think I probably need to read another, like I do follow like CNBC online a little bit and watch a lot of their YouTube videos. Uh, but maybe I need to find, like CNBC is pretty neutral, like uh, New York Times is a little left leaning. Maybe I need to find something that's right leaning just to get the other side, but not like quite Fox News. <laughs> I don't yeah. think I'm ready for that. <laughs> but it's funny um, that you say that because I do a lot of that too. Like sometimes I'll, I'll like listen to, I'll listen to very left and very right, like podcasts or news media. And my friends are like, why are you listening to that? And I'm like, because you have to, you have to be able to understand, even if you don't agree with it, at least understand what, what another side is saying, whether it's politics or anything else. Like you want to be able to, sit in someone yeah. else's shoes and try and understand C your point. Yeah, CNBC is pretty, uh, is slightly right-leaning. So if anyone is listening and is interested in, in that sort of perspective and also just general business news, like I, I really enjoy their YouTube videos and even like going on cnbc.com and following that. Um, all right, so you're in this learning mode. Um, do you have a guiding like 30-year vision for your career or... You know, maybe not like specific goals because I don't think anyone can and should have like, you know, very specific 30 year goals. But I, I definitely imagine you have some sort of vision for your career and, and life um, or some sort of guiding principles or uh, investment thesis that, you know, drive a lot of your, your work and energy. Um, anything come up in that realm for you? Like if you're looking 30 years out? Yeah. You know, I'm not super rigid about it. Like for me, it's, it's how can I create the world that I want to live in and every business that I've ever started, the, the projects that I choose to spend time on, even like advising other entrepreneurs or investing, it all comes down to like, what's the world I want to live in and how can I support the things that are um, creating that world, whether it's someone else creating it and me supporting them or me trying to go and create it through something that I'm building. And that's kind of my guiding guiding principle. And I don't really have, I don't really have handrails other than that. It's just create the world I want to live in and do that. Whatever seems most appropriate given my skill set, time, energy level towards certain ideas. If you could wave a magic wand and you're, you know, you're 57, what, what does, uh, what does a day in the life look like? Like what, oh what, what would that world be like <laughs> that you want to live in? Oh my gosh. I mean, 57. I don't know that I you're, you're unfortunately that. on your, you're, you're probably unfortunately on your second dog or third dog, unless you can somehow take tiger and like clone tiger or extend tiger's life. Maybe that's, that could be possible in the next 10 years. Anti-aging of dogs, of human yeah. dogs would be great. I would <laughs> People would pay so much money for that. Oh, totally. I have some friends through the Teal Fellowship that are working on anti-aging stuff. I think it's super fascinating. I know that I am not. I know Laura is, is leading that, but um, yeah. what about for dogs <laughs> or, you know, I don't know who's doing anti-aging for animals. Someone should do it, but I'm not the scientific person to do it. I will fully admit that someone else is better than me, but I will be the cheerleader. I'll rah, rah from the side. <laughs> it, doesn't even, it doesn't even have to be 30 years from now, but if you could wave a magic wand and start sort of imagining the world you want to live in, like what, what comes to mind? Yeah. I mean, I think 
So I, I'm obviously big into the future of work. That's like a, a huge area of passion for me. Um, I think I'd like to get to a world where people kind of enjoy their day-to-day -day work more often. And so what I mean by that is I know there's a lot of fear. I think when, when people talk about the future of work, there's a lot of fear of people saying, oh, a robot is going to like take my job and I'm not going to be able to pay my bills and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I don't think that that's true at all, but I think that technology and automation and artificial intelligence will give us the ability to be able to focus on things that we're more passionate about or more strategic things or things that are more interesting to us as humans. And that's something that I, I want to see like 30 years from now, I'd love if myself, my friends and everyone else could be actually working on things that progress the world forward rather than just working on things um, because we need money to survive. And so that's a big passion of mine. I know that's an overly ambitious goal, obviously. Um, I also don't necessarily believe that that'll happen in my lifetime, but I, I do want to see the world progress that way. I do want to get to a point where you have more people that are energized and excited about waking up to do their work every morning than people doing the Monday slog of, ugh, I really don't want to be here. I hate my job, but I'm doing it because I need a paycheck. Do you think we're going to need a paycheck in 30 years? Ooh, good question. Very political question these days, it seems. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we still will in the sense that like, we are a capitalistic society. I think that has for the past 200 years in the United States or so has been a good thing. It's gotten us to this point. Um, it allows people. I think it's a good thing. I think it's, I think it's flawed for a lot of people, but I, I would say it's a good thing. Yeah. I think it, there's definitely parts of it that are flawed, but I think this idea that you can go out and build something from scratch and make a name for yourself and, and kind of craft the life that you want to have, is, is a great thing. I mean, um, it, it's kind of like a, yeah, I mean, for all intents and purposes, I think it's, it's a good thing. And I think this idea that you can work for more if, if you want to put in that, that work and you want to learn the, the system to some extent, um, you know, sure you should be rewarded for that for sure i think to your point there's a lot of things that are wrong about it like there's this question of does everyone start at the same starting point or not and i don't believe that they do and i think that we still have a lot of work to do as a society to get to that point i think that things like access to, ed to education and learning should be free um which is why like i whenever people reach out to me i have some friends that are like why don't you charge people for like uh, you know, your time. And I'm like, I don't really believe in that for myself because I want access to information to be free. And if I've learned something, I want to share that. Um, and I think that's kind of a getting everyone up to the same level. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of work still to do there, but that's a whole, like, we could probably talk and debate on that for an entire day and bring people smarter than myself into the conversation. Uh, and I'd, I'd love to learn from them too. Uh, what's your thoughts or, or do you ever see yourself uh, going into politics in the next 20, 30, 40 years and or uh, going into a corporate position with a company that you didn't start and or that hadn't acquired your company of the future and like put golden handcuffs on you. And like when I'm talking corporate, I mean like S&P 500 corporate. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of open to things, you know, there was a point in time where I was like super interested in politics um, and I still am specifically, I'm, I'm more interested in like foreign, foreign affairs than I am um, domestic and that might change with time. I, I've done a lot of speaking with the U.S. State Department overseas, so I think I've maybe had a lot more exposure, which piques my interest more. Um, so I do, I do enjoy learning about 
politics, even though politics seems so broad. I, I like learning about how people and countries interact with each other and the give and takes of, uh, of those two dynamics. Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily rule that completely out. Probably not my like top choice of thing to do right now, but I think it's, it's interesting. Um, corporate, same thing. Like, who knows if a good opportunity came along to move a mission forward for how I want the world to be, I'd be open to it. Um, so I'm, I, I never say never, but, um, historically I've started companies myself. So, yeah. Or I guess we're probably similarly minded. Like I, I definitely don't want to run for office at least not now, you know, and maybe, maybe how we view politics will be different in 20 years or 30 years, but I, I definitely think I could do a lot more outside the the system, quote unquote, than in it. Um, and I am also interested in, uh, I, I am increasingly interested in politics as an idea. And like, like you said, as a relation between people and entities and companies, um, it's been really fun to like uh, go into the Bermuda community, for example, and meet like some of their government leaders and you know, meet the U.S. representative for Bermuda and then see the difference in opinion, like from leader to leader and like how um, things could change or break down when there's transition of power. Um, I mean, all, all the all the shows I watch on Netflix tend to have some sort of political theme to it or strategy element to it. Like anything I get into um, tends to be very uh, political in nature. Because politics could be like office politics too. It's just like how people are relating to each other and getting them all on the same page. It's like that I'm super interested in. Not Clearly you know, I'm interested in that. I'm reading a book on yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in, in that sense, I'm definitely interested in politics. And I, I've been following a lot of the current political events, but I don't think I'm going to run for office anytime soon. And I definitely don't see myself being hired into a corporation or pursuing a, a corporate ladder. Like I, I would you know, want to be acquired, you know, but probably don't even want that. Like, I, I think I'd want to like, you know, leave as soon as I could. Um, but then again, like I, I am increasingly interested in that because if you want to have real change in the world at scale, like you're going to have to work with corporations, you're going to have to work with political leaders and, you know, whether you're part of those organizations or you just find ways to build partnerships and bring them into the conversation. And as part of your meeting of the minds, I do think that's necessary. And so when I was you know, younger, I'm still really young, but like when I was younger, I was like, they're really slow and I don't want to wait for them. I just want to go do my own thing. And that's why startups really interested in me because they just move so quickly and you could get a lot done in a short amount of time. Whereas these corporations that just aren't moving at all. Um, but then, you know, I'm realizing that the investment in those relationships is worth it so that you can have the, the massive change three years from now, 10 years from now, 30 years from now. And I mean, that is how long it might take to solve a pressing problem for society right. uh, and, and really, truly change the world. And so I am increasingly interested in getting those larger entities on board uh, and, and investing the time to build those relationships. But um, yeah, I don't see myself being in office anytime soon or being a chief executive. I'm also, you know, I never went to college. I never uh, had a corporate job. I mean, my, my only jobs have been working for startups. Uh, and even then I was not the world's best employee. because I was always just like side hustling, doing my own thing. I, I got my job done and, you know, I, I think I did a good job, but it definitely wasn't a situation where I was 100% in, if I'm totally honest. Or, you know, I could have been 150% in, um, like I would be with my own thing, but I, I stopped at a hundred percent and then you know, found uh, some room for dessert and then worked on my own things. Yeah. Um, so there is definitely a difference between like starting your own thing and that being your baby versus you're working for another company. Yeah. And I think it's interesting too, because the older I get, I, I feel like when I was, and I still do like it, I think it's definitely easier. You don't have all the politics and you can get a lot of stuff done quicker. If you're, if you start your own company or you're part of a startup, that's a smaller team. Um, and that's definitely one way to go about influencing a market and building something that's valuable and impacting a lot of people's lives. Um, the, the more that I've worked with larger organizations, specifically over the past like five years, working with a lot of big retail brands and stuff through Forge and now WorkJam, 
um, I do have a lot of respect for, for the people that work at those companies. It's like, you know, I could start a company like Forge and, and influence the market and, and touch maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of lives. Um, or, you know, I can go take a job at Starbucks and impact hundreds of millions of people's lives on my first week on the job. Um, so there are different, certainly different ways to think about that. And I think for anyone that might be listening to this, like, um, there's a lot of different ways to have positive impact or work on things that you want to work on. Uh, it just depends on like, yeah, what does your personality kind of gravitate towards and where can you be successful and best optimize your skills to, to push those missions forward? Well, I, I want to be uh, careful with time because I know you're busy, but what else has been on your mind lately that you would want to uh, discuss with the meeting of the minds type crowd? You know, if, if they, uh, if you throw some sort of call to action out or um, thought prompt and wanting people to, to get in touch with you on that, you know, is there anything we haven't covered that you're really interested in right now or passionate about or trying to learn more about that maybe we could, you know, help educate you on or uh, send some resources your way? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I'm interested in a lot of different things. Right now, I'm interested in just learning about other people's businesses that they're growing and seeing how I can be helpful, e either if it's through, um, you know, my skills, my network. Um, I'm doing some advising of companies these days, doing some investing in companies these days. Uh, so if there are people out there that have good ideas and they just want another brain to to bounce some ideas off of, I'm all ears. I love learning about new things. I love helping and supporting entrepreneurs. Um, and so anyone that's, that's willing to take those risks in their life, I wanna get to know and understand and hopefully support throughout their career. And what's the best way people can get in touch with you or where, where should they go visit after uh, <laughs> listening to this conversation? So I'm on all the social medias. Um, so I'm on Facebook at Stacy Ferreira, if you look me up on Facebook, same with Instagram. Um, I do Twitter, maybe Twitter a little bit less than I should, but Facebook and Instagram for sure. Twitter, I might get back to you, but it might take me 48 hours. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, we'll leave it at that. Um, hope to see you in person soon. This has yep. definitely been a little weird um, with the whole pandemic, but we're, we're getting through, getting by. Definitely. Um, Nice to see you in, in your tropical locale. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for coming on our show or podcast. I, I don't even know what to call this, but um, these interviews have been a lot of fun for the newsletter. Um, we've get, been getting some nice growth there. So thanks so much for your time and for your uh, insights. And I, I hope people do take you up on the opportunity to reach out because you, know, you are very accessible and um, very open to a lot of different types of conversations with a lot of different types of people. Um, and so it's, uh, it's great calling you a friend and, and thank you so much. Uh, stay safe and I will talk to you soon. Likewise. Thanks, Jared. I'll talk to you soon. All right.